Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, gamers of all ages, welcome in. Welcome in. It's Tuesday night. It's Twitch. Time to drop some paint on some plastic. Glad you guys are here. So yeah, um, tonight, guys, we're going to continue on with painting uh, Nemesis. The um, We've done the last two weeks, we've done, uh, we did the first, uh, uh, the intruders out of the base box. Then we did one of the expansions uh, last week for the Void Seeders. And this week, we're going to do the second expansion for the base game, which is a race called the Carnomorphs. They are basically like giant flesh beast monster things. Um, I'll show you my sample here. All right, so this is... This is kind of where you're going, right? He's ribs and flesh and, you know, big claw looking thing. And, and so like that's... Actually, they need to pull him back just a hair, isn't he? The depth of field isn't quite right. There we go. But yeah, that's, that's what we're up to. And... Um, this, this, it's taken me a few days, it's taken me a few days to kind of wrap my brain around what I wanted for a paint scheme for these guys. I started off, I knew I wanted red, right? Fleshy, blood color, like the, the color of blood was always what I had in my brain. But if you remember some of the, the doing, looking at the, the Void Seeders and the Intruders that we did earlier, they all had that bright highlighted layer on them at the end, right? They really kind of made them pop just a little bit. A little too much in the case of the Intruder Queen, because I got a little heavy handed over there. But... So I bought colors for these guys thinking that was what I was going to do. And I did some test miniatures on the weekend. One of the things that I've gotten in the habit of doing is, is you know, I have a color scheme in my brain, but before I get on camera on Tuesday night, I sit down and like, I'll, I'll try it out. I'll paint one to be like, okay, did I, am I, cra am I on crack or is this scheme going to work? And my default has always been base layer shade or wash and then that last highlight layer the greens if you remember the intruders had an extra an extra base layer color in there i didn't need it for the void seeders the purple wasn't didn't need it and i bought another i bought a couple of different layers of red to try with these guys and it didn't work out so well uh, in fact by the time i got done messing with it the very first one i did um i like i like you know i did i did the base the base layer the regular layer the wash and then the highlight layer. And the highlight layer, well, let me, let me show you the colors that I'm using. Let me just, let me do it this way. So for starters, nice, simple corn red. Now there is a darker, more burgundy red that I could be using in the Citadel line, but I didn't want that one. It had a little too much purple in it for me. It was, like I said, it was more of a burgundy. This, when you put this on the black, on that black primer, it comes out plenty dark. For my, um... I had purchased, in fact, I got to go get it. <clears throat> I didn't bring it to the table because I, when I started looking at colors, I decided not to use it. I bought another base layer as well. Now, it occurs to me now that I look at this thing, I maybe should be trying this, but I bought this other, uh, this other base layer as well. Now, I haven't used this on any of these miniatures, but I bought the two bases thinking, well, eventually I'll figure out which one I want to use. The shade layer, the, the, the layer paint, that first dry brush layer that I'm using above the base is this guy here, this Evil Suns. And you can see it's got a little more orange to it, right? When you put it next to, you put these next to each other, you can see that I'm starting very dark and plain red and coming up to something that's a little more orangey. The color doesn't quite show up perfectly on camera, but it's pretty close. And then the wash, Citadel makes one nice red wash, this Kerberg Crimson here. And this is a very, very dark wash. The wash is good, is, has been a blessing and a curse, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then for the last layer, I ended up buying this, this pink whore, which is a little darker than I probably wanted. And um, it wasn't until, gosh, I guess it was this past Saturday, that I discovered they make a, uh, Citadel has another, uh, this is like layer, regular layer paint, but they make a series of dry brush paints that are intended to be dry brushed on. They made, a, they made even one even lighter than this, right? Very, very, it's almost like, like probably two, two shades of white in, in mixed in with this, right? And I thought about buying some to try, and I didn't, and I'm, part of me is regretting that, and you'll see kind of the scheme that I've developed to, to, to kind of why I probably should have done that. But anyway, so that's the colors that I've got. What I was do what I started off with was doing them in that order, right? The red, the, the the base red in the corn, the evil suns moving up with a shade. I washed it with the crimson, and then I put on the pink. And when I got done with that, it was the, the pink was just too much. It was it was way too much. And I was like, all right. 
So now I have to figure out how to salvage this. The first thing I tried was, I tried coming back to the wash and just washing the pink down just a little bit. And that worked actually. The end result of that was not bad. The, 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 the unfortunate unplanned side effect of it was that it kind of took away some of the detail on the model. You couldn't, it lost some of the details that the highlight would have pulled out. And I was like, well, it kind of defeats the purpose. So then what I did with the pink was, I, I took a little more of the pink and now I mixed it, I think I mixed it down with some white to try to bring it up, to, you know, bring, the, to bring the color up a little bit, um, lighten it up some, put that on again and it was still too bright. So then I washed it again. And that was where I failed because by the time I put, by the time you put three washes of this crimson on, on any of these reds, they're not red anymore. They start to, they're, they're headed towards that burgundy. They're looking, they look purple, right? Um, there's just too much blue in this, in this wash. So I ended up having to basically scrap that miniature. I had to scrub it down with the simple green and start over. Um, where I've settled finally is I basically, I'm doing the wash last. I'm doing all of the layers and the wash is the last thing that goes on the miniature. And that has what has produced this, this, particular looking scheme, right? And I'm pretty happy with this. It's not, it's perhaps not as detailed as I would wish, but you are getting some of the highlights. The pink does show up. I wash it down so it's not quite so violent. Um, the only thing that I don't like about these, the end result, if I had to, if I had to nitpick it a little bit, is that again, some of the fine details kind of get lost a little bit. But the overall goal, more than anything, I wanted something that was like the color of blood. And these reds with one wash of the crimson gets me there. But as soon as you put two washes of the crimson on it, you get this. This is another one I'm going to have to clean up later and redo, right? Now, it may be subtle to see on camera, but if I put these two next to each other, maybe you can see it. This guy over here on, the, on, on your screen right, is a, just, he's just got that much more purple. He's just not quite as red as the other dude. In fact, that angle kind of shows it pretty decently. So this is the result of two washes with the crimson. So you can imagine what a third wash looked like. So in the end, that's, that's where I settled. Um, I've already done a few of these just to kind of get things started. For example, this is one of the bigger guys. I've got another one of these to paint tonight, right? So, and in the end, he's come out pretty well. I'm pretty happy with this guy. Obviously I haven't done the base yet. I've got to come back in here with the, the gun metal and get everything done. But, you know, for the purposes of what I'm trying to do and, and the, sim the simplicity of the paint scheme that I'm working with, I'm pretty happy with these results. So, in the end, that's what we're going to do tonight. I basically, I'm going to put on three layers. The wash will be the dead last thing that goes on. And all that does is it kind of tones down that pink layer um, that, uh, that gives you the little bit of highlights. And, uh, and you end up with something that actually is the fine. For me, it was all about the final color. The... Yeah, ex exactly. The, the left one is more like the color of blood, which is what I'm after. The other one, like just that one extra shade of crimson and it was too purple. And I was like, nah, this isn't going to do me any good. It's not what I want. So one of the mechanics that they do is these guys will devour each other. So when you have two smaller guys in a room, let me show you what I'm talking about here, right? The, the smallest, the smallest carnomorph. let me put these guys up here so you can see them. These are the, these are the same type of thing, but they have two sculpts for the miniature. Okay. These are called, these are called metagorgers. And when you, when two of these are in a room, they'll like combine into something bigger. Like one of them will devour the other. Or when you put the regular adult, they call these shamblers. When a shambler is in a room with one of these guys and it's the attack phase, he'll eat this guy and become like the next biggest miniature. So they're, they're in this constant state of, if you don't, if you don't kill off the little guys and kind of, you know, keep crowd control going, Things fall apart in a real hurry. It becomes a real mess. So anyways, mechanically, they're, they're, they, are, they are very, very different from the other races, which of course makes them interesting and, and, and gives you some more variety to your, your alien game playthrough. Anyways, um, so you guys, you saw that the two little ones are called, they were called metagorgers. I'll show you what they look like here before they get painted because I've got these guys set aside already. So there's... Again, these are the same thing. They've just got multiple sculpts for the same type of thing here. So those two guys, obviously, we haven't done anything with yet. Uh, and then you've got uh, what they call a shambler, which is this next dude up. He is the, the regular adult alien. This big, fancy, left-handed claw-looking thing. Then you have... Um, I forget what these are called. I think these, are, these might actually be called flesh beasts. I don't know. This is like the next size up. 
Um, in the regular intruders, this is a, this is called a breeder, but I forget what they're called in this in the, for these guys precisely. And then the last miniature, what we've been thinking of as the alien queen, right? That's what the intruder called it, the queen. The um, in the void seeders, it was called a despoiler, and here in the carnivores, it's called the butcher. Look at this dude, double skulls and giant protruding rib cage the butcher it's so funny to me every time i hear i hear the butcher i think of diablo right you guys remember old like you know old school diablo in like 92 or whatever right the butcher was one of the one of the early bosses you encountered down on like level three or something right big dude with a meat cleaver the butcher fresh meat exactly castle exactly so that every time I see, see, see this guy referred to as the butcher, that's exactly what I think of. I think of him having a meat cleaver in his hand, chasing guys down. But um, yeah, he's going to take a lot of red paint. He'll be fun. Oop. Need some agua. Probably two drops for that much. Now, because I know I've done a couple of these big guys already, right? I've done one of these already. And I know, I remember how much paint this guy soaked up. So I'm probably going to start with him and the butcher and get that base layer down because I know that will take up a non-zero chunk of paint. <laughs> One of the other things that I've started to look into, um, I've got some... Um, kind of, I've kind of changed the angle on the painting camera a little bit, so this should help a little bit. Um, I've got some friends, local friends, who um, have a lot of experience with the various st styles of contrast paints. If you know anything about um, hobby painting, you know that a number, a few years ago, Citadel came out with their, what they call their contrast paints. Um, and those have kind of been well received depending on who you, who you talk to and ask. And... Um, I've got a, a good buddy of mine here locally who's been using those and has actually uh, already pre-ordered some of the Army Painter version of that product. Army Painter calls it Speed Paint, I think. Um, anyways, at some point, I'm going to invest in one or the both of them, I don't know which, and um, get them to assist me in learning how to do that. I feel like that will be a good technique to develop when I sit down to paint um, my uh, Batman the Animated Series stuff because I'll you can just prime everything. I can I can prime most everything in white, and then come back in and uh, the uh, the contrast paints or the speed paints should make that a fairly quick process to get through. I would hope. But not ever having used them, it's you know another skill I've got to learn. But. Um, Talking to my good friend who's been helping me learn these techniques, as simple as these are, he was like, he's like, you know, I'm, I've kind of been doing it the other way for so long, I don't have a lot of interest in that. He says, but you know, you're, you're kind of new to this, it might, there might be something there for you, you know, check it out and see what you think. Um, if it works for you, then great, and if it doesn't, well, then you know, you've tried it and you can just go back to doing whatever it is that, that does work for you. So I'm... That's on my radar. It's on my list. I need to go watch probably some YouTube videos on it. I suspect there's probably some people out there that have already got some videos on the techniques or at least the advantages, disadvantages of using the, the contrast or the speed paints. And I just haven't, I haven't made the time to go watch that, go look one up and watch one yet. I've had a lot of other stuff going on. That's, uh, that's kind of what I'm thinking there. So I think, I think for a base layer, that's pretty good, right? I've hit, I've hit most of the highlights. I haven't layered it on too thick. One of the things that I've been focusing on with these guys is trying to make sure that I keep all of these recesses. I want, I want, I'm trying to keep paint out of there because one of the things that I discovered with the, when I go to put that crimson wash in at the very end, the wash, and I'll make a point of trying to make sure I get wash into those crevices because it gives it just a little bit of color and the end result is lovely because you can tell it's painted, but it's it's still very dark, like it's a shadowy recess. It looks really good. So I've been trying to make sure that as I go along, um, that that continues to, uh, to those, those continue to stay empty, let's say. All right, let's get this other flesh beastie guy done here. I need some more.
One of the things I'm also enjoying, you know, th this, this whole process is more than a little intimidating. You know, you start off, you're just not sure what you want to do. Uh, and then once you've got an idea, you're just not necessarily confident in your ability to do it. But now after only a few weeks of kind of messing with this, I feel very comfortable trying things, which is not a place that I expected I would be this quickly. Um, you know, last week working on the void seeders, I had that little, uh, let's say error <laughs> where, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't shake the wash and the end result was all glossy and nasty looking. And I just didn't like it. And you guys were like, oh, you can put some, some, uh, some satin finish over it or whatever and, and kind of clean that up and you won't even notice it. And I was like, yeah, I could, but you know what I'm going to do instead? I'm going to strip these models down to nothing and start over because I want to teach that skill to myself and have, again, have that in my arsenal and that level of confidence that knowing that if I do screw something up, I know how to fix it. Um, and so I spent some time on the weekend uh, doing that. I went out, I bought some simple green. Uh, I soaked them for a while. I got in there with a toothbrush and I scrubbed away most of the nasty. Um, in fact, all that's just, all that's left is basically a little bit of the primer. Most of the primer is still on it, honestly. Um, and then, uh, and then, you know, all of the color is gone, which of course is the big thing. You want all the color to go away because that's, that's the part you want to start over. That's why I've been hunting for primer. I want to reprimer them just to make sure that I've got a nice solid coat of primer everywhere and, and then try to finish cleaning them up. But without the primer, it's been a real um, non-starter to get that project going again. So I'm having to, having to keep looking. I actually ended up ordering the primer from uh, Amazon, which legit irritated me. I would much rather give my money to a local business, but none of the local businesses that carry Army Painter stuff had what I wanted. So sorry, fellas. I tried. I am indeed. Happy little figures. He said, these guys don't look so happy. Let me tell you. You get too close to these guys, they don't look very happy at all. In fact, they look really pissed off. All right, so let me show you. Let me show you this guy now. We did, we did old Butcher here, and then I'll show you. Flesh Beast coming out with that base layer on him. So again, I really kind of like how that... Again, I'm leaving myself plenty of dark in there, and the, the wash will eventually fill that in nicely and leave the miniature looking quite dark in all the right spots. Ugh. One of the things that I've struggled with on all of the various alien models is these, they almost all have little toes or limbs or something that comes down all the way to the very, you know, to make contact with the base. I have struggled with that the whole time. Doesn't matter what race I've been working on, those have all been a struggle to get quite right. Or at least to get paint on them without I mean, you're always going to mess up. You're always going to leave paint where you don't want it on the base at this stage, and that's fine. You're going to cover the base up later, but just getting paint on all the toes has been has been half the war, right? Kind of pull it down here a little bit so you can see a little better. I'll show you this dude. Kind of after the base layer, you can see there we've just again I've hit the high points. There's not a lot down in the crevices, which is by design. See, these guys are a bit of a challenge because you got these long spindly bits, right? And you just got to get enough color on them that when you come back in with another layer that there's something there to layer on top of. But they've got these deep, this small, this particular sculpt of the Metagorger has got this deep recess right here, like a mouth in the top. So I'm trying, I always try to make sure I keep the paint out of that and just try to hit the rest of the thing. About like so. About like so. Okay, so everything's based, so it's time to move up to our first dry brush layer, which is going to be um, this uh, this very very bright. Uh, this is Evil Suns red. I'm going to take a little bit of this and water it down, probably. Probably, eh, we'll just do one drop for now. With the, with the dry brush paints, I want to water it a little bit, but I don't mind them being a little thicker, potentially, because I'm going to, I mean, so much of this is going to go away on the, on the towel when I, when I wipe it all off anyway. Yeah, that feels like it's pretty good. I guess I should move this thing over a little further. You guys can see what I'm up to. But yeah, so there we go. So then, 
get most of that off and then uh, let's pick up our big dude and start throwing some highlights on here. I gotta figure out where to start to kind of get some of this excess off. We'll start on the legs. Just hit him real lightly to start off with. I don't want to go too crazy. One of the things that I'm definitely learning about paint about the dry brushing is that less is more. Doesn't take much. I'm going to leave a little extra on the edges of the ribs there intentionally. Kind of make those pop a bit. Try and do the same thing with his spiky tail bits. And all of these vertebrae or whatever that make up his tail. Try and leave, intentionally leave a little extra down there. One thing that I've, uh, if I'm honest, bothers me a little bit about all this dry brushing is how much paint you leave behind, right? There's, I, I, I you know, <laughs> my, my grandfather grew up in the Depression, right? And so as a result of growing up with him and hanging out with him for all those years, I have this natural abhorrence to waste. And so there are parts of me that when I see how much paint gets wasted and left behind and lost in the process I have to continually like tell my brain shut up it's fine it's fine it's fine <laughs> it's fine it's part of the process it's supposed to happen that way damn you all right so let me clear this view up a little bit so now after the highlight layer you can see he's got he started to pick up a little more of that orange the base red is still under there but he's got a little more of that orange kind of popping on some of the some of the high, some of the ridges and whatnot now, what I was originally doing with, uh, before that I didn't like was I was, at this point, I was washing him down and then adding the pink highlights coming in. We're not doing that this time. Uh, we're going we're gonna, to uh, finish putting the highlight, the final highlight layer on before we wash him down. And the end result will be just about exactly where I want it to be. Um, but I'll put like Babylon 5 reruns or West Wing reruns on stream and it's just background noise while I go. And you know what? It's actually kind of enjoyable, right? It really, it really does turn out to be, to be quite lovely. Uh, it's a nice, relaxing way. I've gotten to where I'll go upstairs and I'll work on like videos or something for a while, or play some boats. And when I've had my fill of that and I'm ready to like start moving towards bed, I'll come in here. I'll just paint for, I'll paint for 30 minutes or an hour, and then I'm, by then I'm kind of relaxed and I'm ready. So here we are. We've got our, our little more again. I've, I've just dry brushed on a nice, simple layer of this, this. Uh, Evil Suns that kind of has got a little more orange to it. Just a little bit of a brighter highlight brings out some of the edges and some of the details. Um, so one of the things that I've been working on is sort of changing up my thought process and how I approach some of this. And one of those ways is for years, the content that I have put onto, Twi onto YouTube has largely been a non-zero amount of Twitch stuff, right? Something I did on Twitch, made on Twitch, filmed on Twitch, and it's like, here, I'll, I want to save it, right? It started off because I was preserving the legacy of the various tournaments that I had cast. And that was important to me. It still is important to me um, that the work that we put into those tournaments and the plays and the, the game results get preserved for posterity. But financially, it's not a very sustainable model because those, those things have a very short shelf life. In fact, video game content on YouTube in general, I find, has a very short shelf life. Because video games come and go, every patch something is different. You know, even, even Warship's videos that I post, posted two or three years ago, that are still relevant, really, don't get watched because, specifically because, they're two or three years old. But, in the board gaming space, the same rules don't really apply, right? Board games don't have patches every month. The change comes much slower if it comes at all in the form of perhaps errata or a new expansion or something along those lines. And so if you want to build some, if you want to build content that over the long term will actually generate uh, some kind of financial, uh, I don't want to say reward, but let's say return, then video gaming on, video gaming on YouTube, maybe not necessarily the place you want to be. So there's our shambler with the uh, 
the little bit of orange highlight layer. He looks pretty nice, actually. And so the board gaming, the, the kind of the, the slow, steady march to doing more board gaming stuff is partly because I really do believe that we need more of this. I want, I want to do this. But partly because I, I want to be able to, to realize uh, kind of some, a return on some of the investment. And with Twitch, it's, you know, work, 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 right? Twitch rewards you for working 25, 30 hours a week. I already have a job like that, right? What I want to be able to do is create content that I can create once, but yet is still viewable or relevant or enjoyable three, four years down the line. When you talk to somebody who writes books for a living, DJ and I had this conversation when he was here in January, right? It's the same principle, right? As a writer, when you first start out, it's very challenging because you probably only have one, two, three books in print. And, you know, unless, unless your very first novel out of the gate is some kind of smashing bestseller, you probably aren't making a living yet. But by the time you've got, you know, 15, 20 books in print, as long as those books continue to have steady, you know, steady sales or steady readership, you can do okay for yourself. To me, I look at YouTube as the same way. If I'm able to build a back catalog of videos and content that's interesting for years, then I make a video and then it's viewable over and over and over again. And again, video gaming does not lend itself to this well because it is constantly changing. It's in a constant state of motion, new things coming and going. And so for me as a, you know, a professional with a full-time job to, to even look at this as, um, something that I could do on the side um, and sustain itself, uh, I really want to really try, uh, and try and do better with that. Zoop used to talk about, I don't know if you guys remember uh, North, American, North American video maker here for Warships, uh, No Zoop For You. You know, he used to talk about, I heard him say at least once or twice that, you know, his stated goal was if he could make enough money off the YouTube channel to, to fund his uh, uh, IRA contributions every year, well, that was a win. And I kind of look at it the same way, right? To me, that's, that's a win. At the same time, what I'm attempting here with the board gaming requires a much larger capital outlay than uh, recording, um, sitting down to record uh, video games off your PC and turn that into videos, right? I mean, just, just the camera work, the, the cameras I've had to invest in alone um, are a non-zero amount of money. Now, one of them, was generously basically loaned or whatnot to me by my, my AV buddy uh, in North Carolina. But I, and I've contacted him on the time. I was like, hey, do you need this back? He's like, no, I'm good. You can, you can hold on to it. I was like, okay. So he technically still owns it. Um, but the other two I bought and that was not cheap. And you know, the lights and the light, the lighting and you know, the table was already paid for many years ago. Thank, thank, the, thank, thank the gods as they would say. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's been a process to slowly build up to, you know, gather the gear and get everything. And I'm, 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 I'm at a point where I could very probably easily do one or two person streams on the table. I'm very close to four player. I just need that. I need one more like real honest to God, 4k camera. That's, that was the overriding lesson I took out of that January stream I did with DJ was the overhead webcam for me doesn't cut it. It's just not good enough quality for what I want for that top down view or that, that board that angled board view. However, I end up positioning that thing for whatever game we're shooting. So process, progress, right? Process. We'll get there. All right. So we've done our base layer. We've done our dry brush, our first dry brush. We're going to come in with our highlight layer. Now, in lieu of what I've done, in lieu of this, this, this is the pink core. We talked about this earlier. Um, I'm going to lighten this up with about half of regular white. I've got some Vallejo here. This is literally what they call dead white. Okay. This is their plain white. I'm going to do probably about a drop of each and then mix them together and then dry brush that down and put that over the top. And then we'll come back with a wash. The, um, you could probably, and I'll, I don't have it, so I can't demonstrate it, but there is a dry brush pink color that Citadel makes. One of their actual dry brush paints that's very light, a very light pink. That would probably work as well. So if you wanted to, if I had to do over again, I probably would have bought that instead of this. Okay. But if you wanted to buy that, Instead of this, and this, this kind of convoluted way I'm getting there, um, feel free. But again, the goal is, and I'm, I'm going to try and put this where you can see it, right? This, this is the base color pink that I'm starting with. This is what I'm trying to get to, right? So what I'm doing here is, is I'm literally taking this and I'm lightening up with some white. 
and that's that's the plan. It's 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 pretty it's pretty simple, but um, this pink is just a little too dark for what I want for a highlight layer. Okay, so there we go. So now we've got our little. Oh, let me get a little bit of water in there, just a hair. There we go. A little bit of white, a little bit of pink horror. Mash these together nice. Get a nice even mix here. I'll probably have to make at least one more batch of this. I didn't make a whole lot and it'll probably dry out before I finish applying it everywhere. I'm also using, intentionally using a very small um, dry brush because I don't want to, I don't want to accidentally put this on a, uh, a spot that I don't, I don't mean to put it on. So we'll start with one of the small guys here just to kind of get them done. It comes off really pale, right? And it, you can, you can probably see why I, I was not super keen on this initially. And I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you in the close-up camera in just a second. Finish getting it on here first. There we go. All right, so with just that little bit of pink dry brush, you can see how it kind of stands out. But from an end result, I didn't like this, right? This wasn't what I wanted in the end. Um, I wanted something darker. So that's why I chose in the end to, to do the wash kind of dead last uh, in terms of how I approached these guys with this final layer. There we go. I'll show you what that guy looks like next to him, right? So you can kind of tell. Let me turn him around here. There you go. So again, with the, with the, with the pink... One of the other things that I like about doing the wash dead last, if I'm a little heavy handed on this layer, it's not as critical a problem because what will happen is when I wash it down with that shade in the end, it won't, it won't show up as badly. You won't notice it as much. In the end, just doing this, the whole miniature looks too bright, right? Which is one reason that I, I'm glad that we're going to come in with the wash at the end. Because if, if, if I had to leave him this way, I don't think I'd be very happy with the end result. But the wash really does help clean it up quite a bit. See, like, color-wise, he's not bad. He's just too bright, right? When you put this layer on him, it destroys that kind of blood-looking color that I'm really going for. And so that's why I've, I've decided I just the wash at the end really, really looks nice. And leave just enough to pull out some of those finer details. Because some of these have got, like, you can see some of the stranded muscles in here, right? The muscles pulled over bones and whatnot. So that's the kind of detail that we don't want to get lost. So that's what this last layer is meant to make sure that we, it gets picked up along the way. Pretty happy with that for where he's at. And again, the wash will clean some of that up. All right, last but not least, our last little flesh beastie dude. Here. It's going to be fun, right? Like these are the first, first miniatures I'm really painting. And in another five years when I've done hundreds more, I'll come back and look at these and my perfectionist brain will pick them apart. And I'll notice everything that I did wrong based on the techniques that I know five years from now, but not techniques that I know today. Because <laughs> that's just the way my brain is wired. Fairly well textured at this point. I think we are basically where we want to be. A little more on the hand. I think that's a hand. Appendage. Some kind of appendage. Yeah, there we go. Or no, I need this one. All right, I'll show you guys what he looks like. There you go. He's looking pretty decent, I feel like. Okay, so the wash, I'm, I'm gonna, well, we're almost down to the end here. I'm gonna do the, the, the wash here. The trick with the wash is, for starters, shake it up good unless you like it glossy. We learned that last week. Secondly, I want to, if you'll notice, uh, and I should put one of these guys back out. Give me a moment, right? There's, 
there's a lot of deep crevices. Like for example, the back of this model is full of deep crevices. Well, right now you can look straight down and just see primer. That is by design for what I'm for what I'm doing. And when I'm done, the intention is um, the painted parts need to get a thin coat of this stuff. I don't I don't need to go crazy, right? Um, my buddy was telling me before I started using this stuff that if I went a little too heavy handed on it, when it pools, it like to pool up as like a brown color. I haven't noticed that as much, but on these models, because of the way I'm using it, I'm also intentionally only really like trying to get it to pool into those crevices where it's already really dark. If it was brown in there, you'd never notice, right? But the goal is to simply like, you know, when you look at those crevices right now, you can very clearly tell there's no paint in there. But if I make sure to get some wash in, in all of those bits as I go along, then at the end result, it looks much nicer. So the, the goal is to, obviously I'm going to be putting, I'll probably be putting just a little bit. I did buy, I did go out and buy a nice dedicated uh, brush for washes. This is what I've been using for washes. Um, the goal is to get just a little bit on, on the painted sections. Again, the goal there, you're trying, all I'm trying to do is tone down that pink and bring the whole thing down to that nice crimson blood color. And then you'll see me intentionally take the tip, get more on it, go back and just like forcibly try to drop moisture, the wash into those crevices and cracks all over the model to make sure that those get filled. So we'll start with the little guys because they're actually very quick and simple. You can see here, I've only got a couple of spots that I have to worry about making sure to get um, darker, some of, the, some of the wash down in. In fact, I'm gonna move this up onto the board because that was a lesson I learned on my very first week. But for now, to start things off, I'm just gonna take just a little bit and just, again, hit the painted surfaces very lightly. Don't need to go crazy. Just that little bit of wash that I put on the tip, very tip of the brush is gonna be enough to hit every painted surface on this model because he's tiny. Make sure we get the undercoat, undercarriage. There we go. All right, so now, you, can, if you guys probably can't tell on camera, there's just a little bit of dampness down in these, in these crevices. I'm gonna get just a little bit extra and just kind of forcibly touch the brush down in there. I wanna make sure that we get some of the wash in all of those spots so that they don't have that dull, dark look to them. If anything, when you look down in there, it at least looks painted and maybe hopefully at least a tonally a little aligned with the rest of the model, a little red, right? So obviously he's gonna to have to dry for a bit, but that's the idea. So we'll hit the other, the other small dude next here. Maybe let me get rid of some of the ex excess just to make sure that I don't, don't go crazy. With the other washes that I've used up to this point, the green and the last week's purple, I was not overly concerned about using too much. But after having seen what too much of the crimson does to the models, I'm very cautious on these, right? Because I want a red model and not a purple one. And like we were showing you guys at the top of the stream, you put too much of this stuff on there and you do end up with a very very purple model, which is expressly what I don't want. I want it to be red. But if you go too heavy handed on this wash, you can end up with not that. So we'll let our two little metagorgers dry for a bit, but you can already tell there the, the color is coming out almost exactly what I'm after. That nice, that nice kind of blood toned color. Uh, had a very nice gift arrive from uh, one of one of one of my regulars. Uh, sent me a lovely bottle, and uh, my wife and I are going to check that out. Kind of in honor of President's Day, I suppose, because President's Day was yesterday. And if I'm memory, well, Jefferson's birthday is actually in April. His birthday is mid-April, um, but we're going to be trying that out on stream. That's the the Jefferson's uh, uh, Jefferson's at sea. They call it. They aged. 
they, they, they barrel the bourbon and then it's aged at sea. I think they put it on a boat for a while, but I don't know how long. I don't know the details, honestly. Um, I know that it's aged at sea, uh, but I mean, a, a good bourbon should probably age at least three years. I don't know if they keep it at sea the entire three years or not. Some bourbon aficionado somewhere is rolling his eyes at me. Three years, that's a baby bourbon. Well, if you age your bourbon in Kentucky, it is. But if you age your bourbon in a warmer climate, three years is plenty. Trust me, I live in Texas. I drink lots of Texas bourbon. We know these things. If you aged a bourbon in Texas 10 years, there wouldn't be anything left in the barrel when you went to bottle it. The barrel would be empty. The angels would have had all of it. Okay. Hit the noggin. All right, I feel pretty good about the layers. Now I need to start making sure we get washed down in all of these cracks and crevices that for the moment have just got little bits of primer in them. Try and get them in there and color that up. At a minimum, make it look like it's been painted. And on this model, there is a lot of that kind of dead space, particularly in the chest cavity area. And these necks, these shoulders are just empty, empty, empty. So now you'll see me going probably a little, a little heavy with this as I'm intentionally trying to lay it into these, these dead spots. Without getting too much on the rest of the model. Okay, that's looking okay. I am not unhappy with that. These two guys dry. I'll let him dry for a bit, but I think he's come out nicely. Mm -hmm. All right, so we've just about hit all the model here. Now these are a pain in the butt because there's a lot of undercarriage in here and you don't necessarily see a lot of it, but I've really got to kind of really make an effort to get it into some of these low spots that don't have paint in them. Sometimes a certain amount falls in there naturally, but some of these deep crevices, it just doesn't happen. There's simply too much. Let me show you what we got. You see there, he's got that nice crimsony color. There's maybe a couple of spots, you know, maybe down here on the feet where maybe it's not, you know, I've got a little too much pink on there and it's a little bright, but again, you know, for what I'm not, I'm not super fussed about every, every little detail being a hundred percent perfect. So, all right, last one. Got to get the wash on him here. He's also got a lot of dead space. I may actually try and work some of this in as I go this time, especially here on the chest cavity. He's got like this giant hole over here on the right. There we go. That worked much better. All right, that's looking pretty good about right now. Pretty happy with that. Oh, actually, I need to go show you guys this over on the stand. There he is. Got to dry for a bit, but yeah. But anyways, so yeah, um, that's where we landed with uh, the Carnomorphs. I think the end result is really, really good, guys. I'm really happy with this. It's got just the right amount of blood and kind of flesh tone kind of feel to it that, you know, I, am, I feel very, very good about where these guys landed.